So I have my box with a mystery object because I love sharing the museum with others. And normally you can come and see the exhibits and collections, but we have a million and a half objects in our collection at the MIT Museum, and so they're not always all on display. And I want to share with you a story about an object that is pretty new in our collection and is a gift of a wonderful family. And I'm going to tell the story about what happens when a tiny little thing comes into your midst. So this uh, story, let me press the right button. Is this activated now for me? Okay, so this story starts um, really back in 2011 when I had a large exhibition uh, that celebrated the 150th anniversary of MIT. And it featured 150 evocative objects. And where you see that red arrow pointing to was an object that I think reflects today's theme of superpowers, the ability to go to another planet, to travel in outer space. What could be a more amazing human superpower than that? So I uh, celebrated this, and the exhibit designers created a really large mural, because we wanted to show not just objects and machines. We wanted to show that people were involved in this. And uh, the picture that we picked showed this simulator in uh, development. And the man that you see on the right of the screen is a man by the name of David Hoag. And David Hoag, I knew at that moment, was one of the important engineers and uh, leader, project leaders uh, at the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory. Fast forward now to uh, 2022, and I get an email from my good friends, Rebecca and Nicholas, uh, Rebecca Atwood and Nicholas Hoag, and they said, we have some stuff of our dad's, and maybe you might be interested in some of that. And I said, sure, I definitely would be interested in uh, anything of your dad. And the thing that they brought with them is on that day in December is this small block of wood with a cylinder. Now, I love objects, but I'm going to be honest with you and all of you. This is not the most charismatic object <laughs> that we have in our collection. It's about the size of a tomato can. It's got some wires hanging off of it and so forth. You can see the enlarged picture up above. But it has this plaque with uh, David's initials. And it says on it, Apollo 8 flight gyro, December 1968. And I thought, really? Is that true? Like, did that happen? And fortunately, you can see on the top here and on the screen where you see the red arrow is there is all the information about this, including the serial number. And so I went to some of my favorite experts who have been working on making a working Apollo guidance computer in the simulator. It's another project we've been helping with. And they checked it all out, and it turns out, yes, indeed, this gyroscope really was on the Apollo 8 flight mission. So that makes it really interesting. If you were to try and buy one of these on the market today, my goodness, it would cost you five or $6,000. You think, you know, it's not as uh, expensive or valuable as some of the guidance computer components. But still, that seems like a lot of money for a tomato can with some wires hanging <laughs> off of it. Now, uh, but the thing about, great thing about being a curator is that you learn to interrogate 
objects, and you start to say, hmm, what is this? What's going on in here? And so the first thing I want to look at is mention Apollo 8. This is the everything but the moon mission. This is the crucial Apollo mission. Before this mission, it wasn't clear that we could get to the moon and back. Uh, this takes place in December of 1968. It meant that we were back on track after the horrific tragedy of the Apollo 1 fire. Uh, and more importantly, it said all of this technology that people like David Hoag and his colleagues actually worked. This flight is famous for this photo. It's the first time it's called Earthrise. It's considered one of the most significant photographs of the 20th century. And it's important for helping to launch the um, modern environmental movement. But let's step back. I'm like, oh, Apollo 8, what happened here? You have to remember here that this all gets started when President Kennedy made his speech to Congress in 1961, and he says, I believe you know, this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, and I'm going to read this exactly, before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. That's the mission that you can see a decade later is characterized in this simple cartoon. It looks elegant and easy. <laughs> It wasn't. For MIT, the story starts with this telegram. Remember, Kennedy's speech is in May of 1961. In August of 1961, an official telegram comes to MIT saying, you've been awarded the first major contract of the Apollo program. Now, normally, today, a federal contract takes months or years even to prepare, thousands of pages. This contract proposal was 75 pages. NASA only had three lawyers, so I guess it couldn't be uh, too complicated. But it said, you're going to do, we'd like you to work and build and design the guidance and navigation system. In other words, how do you get to the moon and get back? This is going to be your Google your Garmin, your triptych, your map. This is the task that was uh, to be taken up at MIT. But why MIT? Well, largely because of the creative genius of this man, Charles Stark Draper. You can see a picture of him uh, as an older person uh, sitting in the simulator, uh, and you see him as a young man, and Draper was known as Mr. Gyro. He pioneered the technology of inertial navigation. That's the kind of navigation that requires you to know where you start, and if you know where you start, if here and you say, okay, I take five steps forward to the right at this rate of speed, and to the left, at this rate of speed, you always should know where you are. It's like those bad crime movies where the kidnapped victim gets thrown in the trunk. And uh, somehow they miraculously remember I was in the trunk and I counted to 50 and we turned right. And of course, because it's a bad movie, they always find the bad guy's lair and there's a happy ending here. But that's inertial navigation, uh, grossly simplified. But they didn't just like Charles Stark Draper. This was the administrator of NASA at the time. James Webb had worked with Draper, the associate administrator of NASA. Um, uh, Bob Siemens had been one of Draper's students. So you think, oh, well, they were just biased towards Draper. But they really felt this is a crucial technology. It happens nowhere else but here. But the instrumentation laboratory was not a one-trick outfit. In fact, uh, in the late 50s, they undertook a theoretical mission to say, could you build a probe to go to Mars? And that is real sized. It was to be launched up. It was to fly to Mars. And it was to take a single photograph and then come back to Earth and drop the negative <laughs> from the compartment. This sounds crazy, but this was actually the American spy program in the 1950s. The Corona Project did exactly this. Drop this 
a negative package and they would recover it. The process, though, of learning about how to go to Mars was really uh, crucial, and it uh, gave a little bit more confidence that maybe these instrumentation laboratory people might know something about space. But what mostly gave them confidence was that they had been uh, instrumental, no pun intended, in designing the uh, guidance and navigation system for the Polaris uh, ballistic missile uh, with the United States Navy. And they said, well, gee, this technology actually worked. And in fact, the launch, this first successful launch, it was four years in the making, and uh, the first successful launch was on July 20th, 1960. Now, this was a big deal for this guy here. You can see here's David Hoag again in the lower right-hand corner. It's his good colleague, Ralph Reagan, and they're both looking at that round cylinder-like structure. That's the heart of the Polaris missile system. And uh, you can see, okay, David Hoag came and he worked on this system and he had been the chief technical designer and also the project manager. So it's no surprise when they submitted that 75-page proposal, they said, we're going to use the Polaris system, we're going to repurpose existing technology, and that's how we're going to get to the moon. And NASA said, okay, great. So a little bit about Mr. Hoag. He was born in 1925. Uh, he died in 2015. He was a really super bright kid. His mother encouraged him uh, to attend, uh, take classes in science and technology. He graduates from high school in 1943, and he goes, uh, he's accepted, he, excuse me, he enlists in the Navy, and he's sent immediately to a Navy program uh, called the V-12 program here at MIT. And that was a way to get more officers and to encourage um, the training of engineers on MIT, or actually on the Navy's dime. So they, he comes to MIT, he earns his degrees here uh, in 1946, and then a master's degree. He meets Draper, he becomes an employee of the instrumentation laboratory, and he gets involved in this Polaris mission. So he becomes in charge of this mission uh, to design the inertial navigation unit, or measurement unit, excuse me, uh, for the Apollo program. That's him looking again. You get something that do the photographers at, at the instrumentation lab have no other pose besides <laughs> him staring lovingly at this uh, IMU unit. The whole system, it fits into this schematic, and what you see circled is that's where that IMU unit is. If you were to go inside, this is a schematic that says, well, at the heart of this are three gyroscopes and three accelerometers that measure your position and your speed. They're gimbaled, and inside, this is what it looks like, really. And that red circle is that end of one of those gyroscopes, just like the one I have in my hand. Now, a pause. I always thought these were gyroscopes here, like the ones you have as a kid, or maybe the ones that are in airplanes that measure pitch and roll and attitude. This is what this gyroscope looks like inside. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, this is out of my league. This is really complicated. But I start doing my reading, and I, it's like a thriller. Because who knew in here where that little arrow points is this little small set of ball bearings there. Turns out this could have delayed or derailed the entire American space program. You didn't know the story of the ball bearings, did you? <laughs> Let me tell you. NASA ordered 300 of these IMU units. Each had three gyroscopes uh, in them. Or excuse me, they ordered 300 of these gyroscopes, like the one I had in my hand here. And so they each had a little ball bearing set. Well, it turns out they'd made assumptions based on Polaris, and those assumptions were completely wrong. Polaris flew for a few minutes for a few thousand miles. This, was, this IMU unit was going to have to run for two or 300 hours 
across a multi-day mission. And so if those bearings failed, then you were going to lose your ability to safely navigate this mission. Well, this project, it turns out, ended up over the course of the decade, they thought those bearings should cost about $100 a set. It cost NASA $20 million to solve that problem. It's an astonishing development. You've never heard of ball bearings, but now you do. Uh, Hoag, that was just one of the things that he was thinking about in leading the group, was not just solving problems like that, but how do you have a philosophy that allows you to make a decision to safely go to the room? This is one of his view graphs, and he describes this multi-point philosophy of how to make the decision. You think, how did they ever make the decision to launch? But launch they did, not just Apollo 8, but of course, on the next important July 20th in David Hoag's life was in fact the time when Neil Armstrong took that small step and landed on the moon. Humans worked on the moon, uh, walked on the moon, of course, they were only halfway there. The mission had to bring them back home. And so those gyroscopes are back in action here on the, um, uh, this is the LEM, come about to rendezvous with the command module. That's the Earth in the background. Uh, that rendezvous happened successfully, thanks. All those gyroscopes are working properly. They did make it back to Earth. That's the safe landing and splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. And I'll just end with this slide. Can you see the pose here? Uh, but now he's not looking, what he's looking at is a lunar sample that was shared with the laboratory in appreciation for this. So I wanna say is this object, like all the objects in our collection, tell remarkable stories. And they tell stories about an individual's superpowers, enormous technical creativity, the ability to motivate a team of 300. It tells stories, really, I think, though, that are even more important and ones that resonate with us today. If we think of our times as being polarized and divided, you ain't seen nothing until you've thought about the 1960s. Uh, in terms of social division and dissension. And yet, several hundred thousand people got together with a common purpose, and they did something that is mind-boggling difficult, is that they took a human being and sets of human beings, they lifted them off the gravity well on this earth and sent them to the moon and brought them back safely. And if that isn't a superpower, I don't know what is. Thank you.